Hello, and how good to be together here, isn't it? Uh, I have a little question first. I was going to do this in English, but are there people who say they would prefer English to Dutch? Want ik kan ook Nederlands praten. So if you prefer English, raise your hands. Okay, I will speak English. Maybe with a few exceptions here and there, okay? Right. <clears throat> Why do people do stupid things? You probably have a, um, some ideas about it. Uh, why do you put your finger in your nose? I, I had not seen this film before. I actually prefer the bit where two drops amalgamate and form one drop. I love that image. But why do you put your finger in your nose and then in your mouth? Well, probably to impress, right? to show that you're not afraid or something. Uh, there, there seemed to be a bit of challenge in that act. Certainly not to appear stupid, and probably not with the aim to be broadcast on Planet X31 in Paradiso. So before speaking about individuals doing stupid things, I will, the sound is good? Yeah. I will uh, say that people can do something that if one person does it, it's not necessarily stupid. But if everybody does the same thing, it starts to be stupid, okay? Like flying to uh, La Palma or something. If we all do it together, it's not clever. But uh, there is such a thing as uh, people wanting to do the same thing at the same time. We love to be synchronous. We love to uh, copy one another. And that can create um, stupidity, collective stupidity, through a process of which nobody is the boss, self-organization. So I'll talk about that first. Um, then I will give my trump card, which is, we do stupid things for love. Love is really the motor of society, and I'm not saying this as a sentimental boy born in 56 who used to listen to Steve Rowland and the family dog, huh? <laughs> and sympathy is what we need, my friend. No, because there's not enough love to go around, that's the, the moral, there's not enough love to go around. That was true, but I... Uh, have come to discover through science, through biology actually, that it is true. Uh, then I will become more scientific about that, talk about status power theory of relations. Um, and actually that's sort of the, 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 the ocean of human nature. I have two legs and two arms and so have most of us if we didn't have bad accidents. And we all have status power relational uh, sociality just like we have two arms and ten fingers. It's the same. So that doesn't mean it's easy to understand or to use, just like your hands and your feet, right? If you want to do all kinds of specialist stuff. But it's the basics. Uh, culture is actually the details about that. So uh, what exactly gives you status? What can you do if you have power or status? That differs in different societies, as many of you probably know. If you are in Amsterdam and you prefer to speak English, um, okay, and then I'll speak about uh, some of the models I make because I'm supposed to do artificial sociality. Okay, so first, self-organization. It works, right? Here you see some elephants creating a path through where they walk. Once they walk there, everybody else will have an easier time walking there. Well, it's rather a barren place, but uh, they also do that in forests. You see my university campus in Wageningen with some seeming elephant paths. Actually, this was when the campus was new. They should not have created those paths and waited one year, and then they would have had the perfect uh, efficient paths because people would have created those paths. Okay, it's nice anyway. And you see also that uh, cyclists in Wageningen had a different idea at Dijkgraaf about how to use a passage between a cycleway and a road than the municipality. It's a kind of a dance, right, between uh, the attempt to control and the self-organization that the cyclists uh, performed. Actually, they need two traces, which is, of, of course, much more efficient than one. This is why they did this. Now, here is a model uh, using a language that you can all download, especially if you're young. It was created for children, actually, uh, NetLogo. You can go to uh, Google, say, download NetLogo, and 10 minutes later you have it, and you also have this model. It's called the Paths model. And here we see one so-called agent. It's called a turtle because the first agents of that language were called turtles. And some programming code, some of you will uh, like to watch it, others not. Let's see what it does. 
So this agent goes to a random spot in the world and then to another random spot, making a little trace in the grass. You see, there is a trace, but it disappears very quickly. The agent takes a random spot, doesn't remember anything. It has no memory. But the system has a little bit of memory because the path remembers if the agent has passed there. Now, what do you think happens if I do the same but with 25 of these identical agents? Not so very much, really. But the point is, if enough people walk in a certain spot, then they may really trample the uh, grass and make it disappear. And that makes a kind of a path. Yeah, you've been here before, I can see that. Um, so you see that in the center there was one spot that created a path. Let me now, oh wait a minute, uh, actually I was a bit fast. Um, this is uh, 250 of these agents. And here they do create paths. This is actually the memory of the system. If you try to change this, it's going to be hard because no agent wants to be the first, right? This is like a society that has some patterns uh, of uh, non-sustainable behavior. How are you going to change it? And now I have some new incentive here. These are buildings to which the agents want to walk. So now they don't walk randomly, but they go to the buildings. But as you can see, they keep using the existing paths because it's easier to walk on a path than uh, somewhere else. So coming up with new incentives does not make people change all of their behavior here because there is memory in the system, self-organized memory that nobody was the boss about. And this is actually often what you can see, for instance, in the geography of places that have been um, lived in for a long time. The, the geography of the place, Roman roads are all across Europe. Because the Romans didn't care who lived in that place, they would just build a, a straight road for the, uh, to go from one garrison to the next. And as you, uh, if you take away those goals, those buildings in this case, the paths still have a tendency to remain. So there's a slow evolution. This could be a metaphor for what people do in society around norms and things like that. Okay, so it's actually a dance between uh, governments and those that make the intent of maybe parents and children or so. And here you can see there's probably mum taking the road and the child taking the, the shortcut and feeling good about it. And there in Schista, in, in Sweden, you can see that actually even the government created a stone path when they saw that people were not, uh, could not be bothered to remain on the path. But people even cut that path. This is how things go. Right, so that's already the first message. We're doing good, right? And uh, the takeaway is everything. Everything, also an evening such as this one, self-organizes. Uh, people were going and sitting upstairs, and I was told by the organizers that they actually preferred you to be downstairs. Uh, I don't know, it, it's good to have people upstairs too. Um, so the history of a system becomes its memory, and this is how society works. And incidentally, why history is such an important discipline, much underestimated wrongly. It's very important. Every living sim, uh, system, therefore, is dependent of its history and the path it took, including you and, and me and all of us. Uh, that leads to the situation, and this is a, an Italian psychologist uh, who said this, we do not intend the consequences of our actions. And climate change is a very good case in point. We do not intend to mess with the Earth climate, but that's what we're doing ever worse. Every year is worse than the previous. Maybe Corona gave us a, a slight pause, but it's already gone. Um, I have literature here. I suppose these slides will be available somewhere. So if anybody is interested, most of the literature that is here is actually very readable. So this is already sort of um, concentrated uh, research. Okay, okay. Now we come to uh, the nice part, because we do these stupid things. Also, other things, like being polite. Uh, it's also a way to, uh, to uh, be nice to other people, to show them that you love them enough not to want to give them COVID, right? This is why we're all so uh, nicely arranged in rows. Uh, so, for love. Uh, you know who these are? 
I prob you probably need to have a certain age to know who these people are. This is a film f uh, made in 1995 out of a book from the 19th century by Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. And as in many love stories, it takes a full book for two lovers to come together. Why? Because it starts at a party, and there is a surplus of ladies at that party, and there's a, a handsome gentleman, you see him on the picture here, who cannot be bothered to dance with those uh, girls, because he considers them beneath him. So this is about social status. One of those girls is Lizzie, uh, uh, on the uh, other side, and she is offended by that behavior, rightly so, I think. And so he becomes pride and she becomes prejudice. But there is some magic about love. Sometimes you think that somebody is so lovable, you cannot help but love them. You want to be near them, you want to give them flowers, kiss them, and so on, and marry them when it's a book. And that's what happens to uh, Darcy, the name of the man. So he proposes to Lizzie, but specifies, I'm actually of a much better family than you, I still want to marry you. Now that's when she really, really takes her revenge, because he was adding insult to injury. So uh, she says, uh, I could not have accepted the offer of your hand um, in uh, any way, but the mode of your declaration merely spared me uh, the pain I might have felt had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner. So, uh, which is a nice phrase to remember you young ladies in the room, if ever uh, you need it. So, but the worst thing is he tries to forget her and it doesn't work. Actually, standing up made her even more desirable in his eyes. So in the end, they get married and as you can see here, uh, actually I could do this from a distance. Um, they seem to really now love and like one another. Because those two things are different. So loving is a one-sided thing. I love somebody. Eh? Uh, c'est con de je t'aime qui commence par je. Je sais pas qui connaît cette chanson. The, the, those uh, fucking I love yous that start with I. It was a French uh, pop song in the 60s, I think. So it often starts with me because I love you. I want to love you. Let me love you. Things like that. Liking is not the same. If I like you, I know that you will be nice to me and I will be nice to you, but I don't lie awake at night dreaming of you. That's love, that's not friendship. So there are two very different feelings here, and uh, I may come back to that later, but I thought it could be nice also for you to re relate that to your own experience. So we have a deep need to love. This is important. Uh, now I made, uh, I made a, a flow chart of that in my blog, which is on geerthofstede.com. Geert Hofstede is my dad. I have a blog of that. Uh, that I actually take fairly seriously. It looks a bit silly. Eh? Beetje viva zo. Um, so how do we get love? Imagine yourself a baby or a toddler. For the first time you go through this diagram. Uh, first you find somebody, it's probably a group, it's your parents, your siblings, your uh, grandmothers and grandfathers. Actually, I, I know from experience, the best thing in life for love to flow freely is being a grandparent. So I can advise all of you, if you're not a grandparent, make sure you become a grandparent, okay? Um, so you find somebody to love. It's, it's going to be your... Okay, Neil says I got It's going to be your parents. Uh, then, uh, somehow, you uh, show that you're worthy of their, of, your, of their love. For instance, you yell very loudly because you're hungry. And uh, in, in, in box two, if that claim is successful, in three, your mother or maybe your father picks you up and starts to cuddle you and comfort you and give you something to, uh, to drink, as I used to do with my babies in the middle of the night because they were bottle fed, then uh, you're happy. They love you, box four. And probably you will return by smiling at me or something. My children would do that to me. And then uh, you have a happy cycle, which I actually also drew. Happy group life. And we could all do it together, uh, too, this evening, right? We, we're, we're on a good track here. Um, but it could also be that if you are in box two, you try to be interesting, or not, for instance, I try to be a really interesting uh, speaker, you find me boring, you all start to go on your mobiles. So then I end up in box three, in box three and six. My claim is not successful. And I might, if I'm a sociopath and I had a difficult youth, I might uh, give up and uh, go to box nine. Probably I will go to box seven, 
uh, and I should be ashamed of myself, so I, sh I should be contrite, or maybe a bit sad. I could also blame you, and this is actually a big distinction. Uh, if you think somebody is worthy to criticize you, you will blame yourself. If you don't think that, you will blame others, and this is down to whether you learned to love and therefore to blame yourself when you were little. Uh, very important distinction, because if you are contrite or sad, you will actually go to box eight and try again, and you will become better at your status claims. So you will not yell, uh, but uh, have a nicer way to uh, attract attention when you're hungry, and so on and so forth. Uh, acculturation it happens uh, automatically when you're small, but it's much more difficult if you emigrate to another place as a grown-up, like to your in-laws or so, or another country. <laughs> so uh, you, you claim again and you learn to claim. This is how we acculturate one another. And these are the tracks in that path's model. It's the path in which all the others keep you, so you have to walk that path. Of course, if you haven't really learned to love, if you had not had a safe home, maybe, you know, your, your dad left away when you were small, your mother was always drinking or had a headache, I don't know, uh, then it's more likely that uh, you don't like to be corrected, or maybe you were corrected with a lot of force, a lot of power, then you might do the same thing again. You might try new groups. And if you're an ad adolescent, well, you have to, right? or if you change job, you have to try a new group. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, it can be a good and a necessary thing. Anyway, um, but it could be that uh, you keep hopping groups. Some societies make that very easy, others make it very, very difficult. For instance, some religious uh, forbid you to leave them um, because the purpose of a religion is to keep a group together. So, uh, okay, that's group hopping. And finally, if all uh, goes wrong, you might end up shooting uh, bunches of people in, uh, in large gatherings. Uh, although you might even also do that for love, because your system of reference groups, I will talk about that later, is uh, structured in such a way that the groups that you love uh, um, think well of you uh, killing people who are not in that group. That could be the case. Okay, so this is the flowchart. You can go to the blog to check it. And that's the end of my second, uh, the second part of my lecture. So, um, we have to learn to love when we are little. Actually, Abraham Maslow can tell you the same. It's a very good book, read it. Better than just the pyramid. Um, he was a, a psychologist, and he had all these deranged people in his practice. And that's how he came to uh, see that uh, the, um, whether they had learned to love when they were little is so vital. And we don't necessarily need uh, individuals. It takes a village to raise a child. So it could be that it's a group, a reference group. And in some societies, there isn't a lot of individual uh, parenthood. It's much more shared. Uh, that's not the case in the Netherlands, typically, uh, although there are differences. So... Um, now comes the, the bad point. To earn status, to be a good member of our reference groups, we'll do anything. We'll eat the stuff that comes out of our nose. We'll do any other silly thing, including sometimes very stupid things, or maybe things that other groups uh, consider to be bad. Huh? It's one of the ways to, con to show yourself worthy of status, to debase others. There's a lot of uh, talk about ontgroening these days, which is the practice that older members of student clubs debase the newcomers. And after the newcomers have paid that very, very high price of entry, they will do anything to stay in the group. Um, our early reference groups of our childhood will determine how we love and whether we are good at it and how much fear is involved. So the best thing you can do for the good of the world is love your children and your, uh, those near you, especially when they're very young and need you. And take, spend time on them. Fear can uh, turn love into something else. So you could kill for love, but there is, of course, fear involved. Otherwise, you would never need to kill. So that mixture is a dangerous one. Okay, now I come to the hard part. Are you ready? Yes! Yeah? Okay, some, some people are ready. Yeah, good. Uh, so um, 
I read lots of books on social science. Actually, I read a lot about primates when I was younger, and then finally I decided that we're also primates. I'm a primate. And so uh, our um, sociality is a lot like that of primates, only we have these taboos, especially for studying uh, status and power relationships. For obvious reasons, because it's better for us to disguise those motives to ourselves in order to remain noble in our own eyes. So we are sort of programmed to fool ourselves into thinking that we're not status power creatures, but we have a, 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 a positive self belt like um, um, Nancy Kleurblind was singing. But our self belt is, of course, given to us, as she also, of course, knew, by those around us. Okay, okay. so here you see um, uh, the author whom finally I thought was the, the, the best in that domain, theory, uh, Theodore Dave Kemper. He's now 94, I think. And um, he connected physiology, sociology, and psychology in the 70s, the 1970s, and, and wrote about testosterone and all kinds of things. But he was so much ahead of his time that he didn't really make it to be famous. And he didn't have a, a publisher like my dad, who saw the merit of his work, uh, or who, yeah, well, he did, actually. He was published by good, um, um, by good houses, but sociologists just said, this is too outrageous. It cannot be true. Uh, but meanwhile, you've had the opportunity of reading these two um, Venn uh, diagram circles of words, and you could see probably that there's a difference. Right? And the left-hand side is different from the right-hand side, and the center is the most interesting, actually. Those are the most interesting words, because the left-hand side are words that have to do with status. Like, uh, uh, know that you did badly, you're not deserving, when you sh you're ashamed, or you know that you did well, you're proud, or uh, being attentive, all that kind of stuff. Are you looking at me? Ah, I, I, I'm getting something. So, uh, now this is a status accord, you know. Yeah, some of you have, have uh, cocktails, but not many. Uh, cheers, first. Um, now you can uh, amuse yourself uh, considering how strong this cocktail is. <laughs> From my continuation. MS3, Oops. MS3. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's alive. Okay, so left-hand side, it's um, uh, status. Uh, and most of these things are actually good. This is what you like, okay? Uh, to be worthy. Um, a joke is also a claim to status. If you make a joke, you want people, people, to, people to laugh. If they don't laugh, they're punishing you, probably not because the joke is not good, but because they, they think you don't have the right to make a joke. Huh? Um, <clears throat> on the right-hand side, these are the words that, uh, you know them from some places, right? Some people like to use those kind of words. Not in the Dutch society so much. You're not supposed to do it, but many leaders in other countries like some of that. In the middle, that's when it's ambiguous. Love is supposed to be all about uh, giving status, but very soon the loved one is not returning the status. What do you do then? Huh? You become jealous and things like that. Okay, so... <clears throat> This is a sort of miniature vocabulary of status power theory of relations. So to behave, uh, behave, you have to behave. That's what they say to children. It means stick to the path, uh, know uh, which parts of the path are good for you and do that and nothing else. It means give appropriate status to everybody according to what they deserve. Do not use power except if you are mandated to your dog or so. Um, be loved or admired means receive status, and that's, that's actually also a way to do that gracefully. If people admire or love you, and you keep saying, no, 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 you have my verjaardag niet te vieren, nee, 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 you're not being fun. You have to love yourself a little bit in order for you to have something to give also. If they want to make you uh, celebrate your birthday, enjoy it, try it. Everybody wants to be loved and admired, but some people are so afraid that it's not going to work that they'd rather not try. Or maybe they're afraid that it's seen as claiming status. That's the thing in the Netherlands. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Claiming status is very bad, and very, especially for women, especially for women in politics or public life. Uh, they should keep their mouths shut. Okay, yeah, well, it's a sensitive subject. 
And I have four daughters. I have four daughters who are uh, getting along in life, and uh, you know they have to work harder for it than uh, others. Okay. Um, belonging or being significant is something uh, akin to being loved or admired, but it has the group around it, and that's when it becomes difficult. You know how uh, um, there's a saying. I, I used to hear that when I was a teenager. Jongens zijn leuk als ze alleen zijn. So boys can be can be nice, but not when they're in a group. Because then they're starting to brag to one another instead of relating to you, uh, poor girl, uh, whom they actually love but uh, cannot be bothered to show that in the group. Um, admire or pay attention. Very, very important. If you admire somebody, you should probably show them. If you admire somebody, pay attention to them because there should be enough love to go around. So, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> So that's conferring status, and you also need to learn that. You know how a lot of the education of children is, yeah, you're getting a stukje vlees bij de slager. Zeg eens dankjewel. Thank you. Nee, je moet het wel menen. Dankjewel. Okay, so that's very important in our culture. You have to mean the status conferral. It should not be a disguised dismissal. It should be a proper status conferral. Like when Darcy proposes, he should properly do it. He shouldn't say, uh, I'm proposing you, but you're beneath me. No, that's not good enough. That's not a status conferral. So, uh, finally, uh, you have the claim to status. Uh, I'm claiming status by having the president's uh, collection suit. And this connects me to Nelson Mandela. And uh, so, um, everybody has these ways of dressing up to a party to uh, please those who are important to you. And of course, uh, there's no end of trade in clothes, in perfumes, and so on and so forth, for claiming status. And finally, the red letters. When the status game goes wrong, that's when power starts to be involved. That's when you start to make others give you the status. Like, for instance, saying, yeah, wees nou still, jongens, ik ben aan het praten. Fortunately, I don't have to do that here, but it would be a power move on my part. And you can see it a lot in, uh, in schools. But it's also a kind of, in the Dutch situation, it would be a kind of, um, it shows that the teacher isn't really worthy of status if the, if the, the class are not silent. And these small rules about uh, classroom situations uh, differ in different societies, which incidentally makes it very difficult for teachers from different countries to work in another country. They run into all kinds of unanticipated trouble. So fighting, coercing, deceiving is power. Okay, you've got the gist of it. This Kemper guy writes very, very well. I can advise you if you're interested in this kind of stuff, maybe start with the 2070 book, Elementary Forms of Social Relations. It's not the, the nicest, but it's sort of short and comprehensive. One thing that I have not talked about so much is this is all about groups. For Kemper, we have in our minds, and this forms during our, our formative years, we have reference groups. And it could be uh, our parents or our siblings or our teachers, but it could also be Harry Potter, or it could be God, or uh, it could be uh, a dog. And then most people would throw you away. So that's a dog. So. Uh, Anything that helps you go through life because you know they confer status on you and they, they show you what to do and how to be a worthy person will help. Um, and it's often the case that you have different of those groups and they might give you contradictory advice, especially if you're a teenager or if you emigrated or, you, or if you're married or if, you, or if your marriage is not going well. Different voices in your mind are telling you to do different things. And Kemper uh, has the image of the reference group committee that meets in your mind and uh, there's a certain decision, will I go to uh, science and cocktails, will I walk away now because it's too offensive? And uh, those groups uh, then confer with one another and they all have a certain status power standing. Some groups have the power to punish you if you don't do what they tell you. Others have the power to make you really proud and happy if you do do what they tell you. And this, the outcome is then your behavior. And on the picture, actually, you see three of my grandchildren. Uh, they're not brothers and sisters, two of them are, but you can see they're having a really good time. Also, of course, because their, their granddad is, is shaking their uh, uh, hammock. Uh, so 
I am a very important reference group to these children, and uh, I won't remain that for always, but I am now, and I am, it is within my power to make them extra happy and uh, to make them feel good about themselves, which is the greatest feeling. So, uh, make love, not war. <clears throat> Uh, and I am actually very con um, confident that those kids will know how to love. So the first years are so important. There's a lot of talk about schools, but the first years before that are so important. Fortunately, uh, if, even if you've had a rotten youth, you can tell me, uh, well, but John, you're telling me I should have had a better youth. Well, you're, you're still there. So you can all become a reference group, or with, with friends of yours, for other people as of today. That's the good news. So by giving status, you will make people want to give status back to you. You will make them feel better about themselves. This is so important. And actually, what we have in Dutch politics right now is a horrible lack of precisely that. Even Khaldun, the Tunisian scholar of the 14th century, calls it asabia, which is the, 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 the love, the quantity of love to go around in a society. We lack that. Everybody talks about transparency and a new beginning, but we just have to finish the fight first. They're just finishing the fight, and it's after that that we can, uh, can move on. I am actually not jealous of politicians. They have a rotten job, they don't make a lot of money, they get, get pissed on by everybody. Um, but okay, they, they do have a mission and a task also. Okay, so we become a reference group. And the thing is that this happens all the time. I see many things happening in the room. Some of you are, are working on your relationships with one another while also listening to me and working a little bit on your relationship with me. I don't see you very well in, uh, there because of the light. Um, okay. So the takeaway of status power theory, we were made in a very real sense because like my limbs and my legs and, uh, and uh, arms can only function properly if I trained myself when I was a child, which I did, I was always climbing trees and uh, walking in the forest or running around. And some children don't do that and it, it will pursue them for life. In the same way, your sociality has to be trained. You have to learn to love. You have to learn to settle, the, uh, settle uh, disputes and to receive frustration and know that you can live on. Eh? Frustratie, tolerance, very important. Um, uh, so we uh, have these reference groups in our mind. Uh, I told that before. Uh, we perceive um, status, so we know whether we are doing well or not. And if we have the choice, we might actually leave those groups that don't treat us well and go to other groups that treat us better. Uh, this is a very natural thing to do. Uh, and if you don't treat your spouse well, well, he or she might actually walk away too. Huh? Uh, that's how we are. Um, so, the most of the status uh, uh, giving and taking goes involuntarily. You, it just happens. So, for instance, some people, when you pass them in the corridor, maybe uh, if, 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 if I like you, I will, I will go like this, and you, you, it's difficult not to smile back at me. Uh, if I don't like you, I may give you a cold shoulder, right? Uh, these things happen all the time. You can do it deliberately, but yeah, then it's actually a power use, and you're deceiving people. It's happening involuntarily. And there are cultural rules about it, so it's easy to misunderstand what people mean if they haven't learned the same uh, rules as you. Uh, I'll talk about that presently, by the way. Okay, you can use power, but it always creates resentment of some kind. One day, you probably pay the price, or somebody else, tragically. Right? Uh, somebody else can pay the price later. You mistreated your children, somebody else pays later. Okay, okay. now... You'll probably also know that I am the son of Geert Hofstede, actually one of four sons, who started this work on culture. And he published his work after failing with 16 publishers. The 17th Sage Publishers had a lady uh, at the head of the company and she decided to publish the book. And she had a, a good title for it, Culture's Consequences. Culture uh, was always very important to me, also having lived in different countries as a child until I discovered that actually it's not the essence of human nature. The essence is status power theory of relations. Culture is the ripples on the ocean of human nature. 
And that's what interests us. We tend to take human nature for, great, for granted because we, were, um, we evolved to have that uh, unconscious competence in it. It's very difficult for us to consider this. Also to consider culture, but the human nature is even more difficult. I also think that uh, social scientists have painted themselves into a number of little corners. It's the ivory archipelago that some uh, authors write about. Unfortunately, we need to go back to realizing that biology, biology, evolutionary biology, is the mother of social sciences. And I think this is going to be the century of biology in that social sciences. And it's, it, it, it's not disparaging to any of the social sciences at all. But everything evolves. We, all of us, are actually, we have the same... Um, 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 the same spark of life that the very first life on Earth had. There was never a moment in between that there was no life. Imagine that. It's so old. I mean, so our lives are sort of billions of years old. That means also that evolution has not forgotten anything in the meantime, but invented new tricks all the time. Right, so culture. <clears throat> Culture is actually the details of our sociality. Sociality, you could define it as orientation towards other people. What is human sociality? We have a status power world of individuals in groups. Most primates, most social mammals have that too, actually. So we are eusocial. We, uh, it's from the Greek, it means good social, very social. Uh, these social groups need to link uh, their status power world to their surroundings, to practices, to things that they do, to child raising, to defecating, to procreating, to uh, dying. And for everything, they develop rituals that have a certain status power connotations. How expensive is your marriage or your burial, for instance? So that's culture. Uh, and underneath that are uh, ideas about the social landscape. Uh, how much more power should some people have than others, or how much more status than others. Um, all that is very ancient, and uh, it means that we have this the whole is more than the sum of its parts thing that I talked about already. How much time do we have? Um, so, uh, here is uh, a picture of my dad and me. He died last year, just before the uh, corona lockdown, fortunately. And Misha Minkov, the third author of the third edition of the popular version of this um, book by my father, Cultures and Organizations. And it now counts six issues that societies need to come to grips with in order to survive as a society. And they actually have a lot to do with status and power. So, um, individualism is about collectivity, identity, it's about the unit of status. Is it the individual, is it the religious group, is it the national group, or the ethnic group, or the gender, or the age group? Which, where do we create the boundary? And in the Netherlands we have a self-built, we have very much the individual as the unit of social life, but it's the exception. Hierarchy. Are all people, in principle, equally worthy of status, or not? And in most societies, that's not the case. That is the kind of God-given uh, order. And it's probably also linked to other characteristics than uh, uh, just knowing some, something about somebody. It's it linked to age, for instance. I noticed that it's easier for me to be respected now that I'm older. I used to have a baby face and look very young. Um, so uh, I'm sure that uh, there's also... Did you see that Rutte and Hoekstra had a 5.0 for a political grade and Kage 4.4? That's probably a gender effect yeah, right now. Uh, so uh, there are all these effects, uh, and the more hierarchical a society in the Netherlands are less egalitarian than we like to think, uh, the more it's also linked to cat categories of people. Then you have the third one about aggression and gender. That's power, not status, right? How much do we uh, condone the usage of power in society? Does using power give you status? In the Netherlands, not much. You shouldn't be a politician and, and wave your muscle too much. It's, it's ridiculous, really. It's a bit silly. Um, otherness and truth. Do we fear things that we do not know, such as uh, pandemics? Do we overuse um, um, disinfectants? Yes, we do. 
but not equally in uh, all societies, more so in societies that are high on this otherness and truth dimension, uncertainty avoidance. Then, do we live for now? Is the game of status power here and now really very important? In that case, if we have a good evening, we don't know when it stops, and we will ju just go on and have fun. Or do we have a long-term oriented society? In that case, I have to fetch the train because I have other things to do tomorrow. Finally, indulgence. I also have a body. Is my body important? Can I make it happy? In the Netherlands, yes. In many other countries, no, no, no. You should punish the flesh. Italy is a very good case in point. That's why they like rules so much. If there is a rule about mouth masks or anything else, the Italians are very quick to follow it. And the Dutch keep negotiating about it because nobody dares to really enforce the rule to others. So uh, you see, these are these six issues of social life, and you can actually plot them. Here's a plot for Europe, where I show three of these dimensions. You can find this on my website, geerthofstede.com. So you see here the uh, power uh, axis masculinity on the horizontally. So countries on the right-hand side are countries where being macho and powerful gives you status. Or if you're a woman, being very feminine, you know, maybe enlarging and lifting your boobs. Uh, on the left-hand side, it's more uh, sort of um, um, unisex uh, and uh, uh, using power is not seen typically as a good thing. Sit down and talk. Don't stand up and fight. Then the vertical axis is power distance, which actually the word power in the Hofstede framework means what Kemper would call status, and I have called status until now. So this is about if you have a lot of status, you're the president, uh, does it give you power? Does it give you the right to use power? Putin, yes. Eh? Romania, yes. Ceausescu, some of you remember. Uh, since then, the leaders were less uh, sort of memorable. Um, so those two axes there give you an idea about uh, what leader follower dynamics you can expect in a country. Uh, in the top of the diagram, you can expect revolutions because once somebody is in a, power, in a high status position, they are likely to believe that they belong there and it's a God given right. And they might actually tell you that they are related to God and they're not very likely to go away of their own accord. Uh, then there is a, a third dimension, individualism. Uh, I won't talk about it now because I need to go on. We have some question and answer time and I'm maybe uh, wasting my, uh, too much time. See, they're already leaving. Oh, so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay, takeaway for sociality. So, status power world of groups, it's like our body. It's really ingrained in us. Evolution put that into us. And there was this question about the relationship between sociality and intelligence. We use our intelligence at the service of our sociality. Also to disguise uh, our lesser motives that we don't think our state is worthy. We don't want to know about that. So we tend to be less good than we like to believe ourselves. Also, we, uh, there's research, we, we think that we're more beautiful than we really are. If, we, if you show us a number of pictures uh, of ourselves, some are manipulated to make us more symmetric and others to make us less symmetric, we think that we're a little bit more beautiful than we really are. And those who can properly recognize their own face, are t uh, they tend to be depressed. So actually, we fool ourselves and that's how we thrive. But I just told you, you can do that with others. Be nice to them, give status, tell them they look good, even if you're not so sure, because it will make them look better and feel better. Compliments are good, flattery is good, unless you use it for your own advantage, because then it's power use. Um, okay, so uh, we live in the status power world with persistent differences between cultural groups, because they are also a currency of status power. If I dress up as somebody from a certain group, I'm giving status to that group, and uh, I want to distinguish myself to, from another group, from the next one. Um, this is evolving all the time through group level selection, and that is not stopped by no means. And we are evolving very fast in all kinds of ways, including resistance to disease, by the way. Uh, our success in the world, the fact that we're now uh, so numerous, forces us to understand ourselves better. It used to be that dangers were all uh, natural and maybe uh, animal or so. 
But now we're so numerous, we're creating our own new natural dangers. All these disasters. Also, I understand, for instance, the, the grain harvest in Canada failed this year due to the, the uh, heat. That's going to make world prices unstable. That's going to cause political trouble. So climate change is already uh, sort of uh, increasing in its ramifications, and it's no joke. Um, and so, yeah, <clears throat> enough. <laughs> uh, I will show you now one little exercise. Do I have time for this? Yep, yeah, okay. One little exercise uh, with a net logo. It's a bit like the paths model that you saw, but here I have groups of uh, these turtles, these agents that uh, have sociality motives. Uh, the aim of that is to stay close to the real system. An agent-based model lives, it evolves, just like the real world. It has uh, an environment, well, okay, it's simplified, but it's like the real world. And there are environments, also programming environments, that allow you to do much more than this NetLogo system that I show you. But I'm not a good programmer. So you have computer scientists who can go much further in all kinds of simulations, some of which you saw there, the crowds uh, simulation. So I give that sociality to these simulated people, and I let them self-organize, and I hope that this is going to be helpful for policy, not because it predicts the future, but because it allows policymakers and stakeholders to see what could happen if, in a real, thank you, in a real situation, right? Um, that's better than just arguing. So instead of saying yes, no, yes, no, you're all looking at the same scenario and you say, wait a minute, what does that mean? And uh, why do they do that? And uh, ah, that, I recognize that phenomenon. So uh, it's a bit like being in a hot air balloon and looking down, you have a miniature of the world that you look at. Um, so actually, simulating sociality is allowing agents to do all kinds of things, including stupid things. Right? You can have scenarios just like the Club of Rome in 1972, in which people uh, use up the Earth's resources. But now the challenge is to really talk to uh, those that have power and can change things. Things are changing, but it's a bit slow. So let me talk about those agents in those models. Actually, uh, today and the coming few days is the, uh, the, the time of the Social Simulation Conference. It's in Krakow this year. I would normally have been there, and not here, but it's online. So I spent my time in Zoom with those people uh, um, conceptually in Krakow. In most models, agents have some kind of utility function, uh, maybe financial, maybe otherwise, could be also uh, in terms of status, and they have cognition that supports that utility function. But I say, wait a minute, they have all kinds of other agents around them uh, who influence them, and uh, they have, it has relations with all those agents and emotions. It could be proud about certain things, ashamed of others. If it has uh, perpetrated violence, it could feel guilty. If um, <clears throat> it uh, has power over others, it could feel invulnerable and, and, and smug. So <clears throat> there are all these emotions, and they're all related directly to the status power model. It's easy to relate emotions to that. But emotions are not the, the start. And there's a lot of talk about emotions. They come from something. They come from status power developments around yourself and connected to your groups. If an agent grows up and becomes a big agent, it can itself start to be a powerful reference group, telling others what to do. I once had a, a conversation with a classmate whom I, he was in fifth grade in uh, secondary school. I, I admired him so much, I, I really loved him. And he was doing, he was uh, uh, babysitting somewhere, and I came there and we talked. And uh, I, I told him how much I admired him, and he said, Echt waar? But, but I have the same with you. And um, that was a breakthrough for me, the, the idea that I could actually be valuable or special or something, not that we fell in love or so, but we, we just mutually uh, respected one another. So, uh, yeah, it can be very influential, especially at that kind of age, to tell somebody the good news. Uh, so this is what uh, motivates agents also in simulations of uh, climate change or fisheries or uh, pollution or uh, city dynamics, smart cities or so. So I'm working on all those kind of projects. 
I could model the cognitive, I like to model the relational, as you have heard from me now, and of course there's also the collective, how does that lead to an emergent result? Um, and yeah, maybe good uh, if you like that this paper, Cultures Causes, the next challenge, it's sort of a, a summary of my thoughts there. So Cultures Consequences was the big book by my dad, but how come we still have those cultures? I mean, everybody travels. Don't we have a global village? Are there still cultural differences? Yes, there are. And for reasons that they keep recreating themselves. We like to be separate from other groups because we want to be better. Every group wants to feel that it's more worthy of status. If you don't feel that your group is more worthy of status than the next, you will leave. You won't stay. So it's, we are doomed to have this multi-group world uh, in which we think that we are so good, unless we become really good at understanding ourselves and also realizing that we are actually all frogs in the same wheelbarrow and we have to stick it out together. Okay, so I've developed this meta-model of sociality where I say, if you make models of uh, anything that's policy relevant, there should be potentially different groups, maybe campus reference groups that have meetings in your, in your mind, maybe something else. They should have rituals, meaning actions that have a status power meaning in that group life. The basis is affiliation. They want to be together. It's good to be together. It feels so good, certainly after a year of corona. If it taught us anything, that's how important it really is to be together every now and then. It uh, uh, may have come as a surprise to quite a few people. And then, of course, it's about status and power. I talked about those two. So grasp. And here is that sandbox. It's a, uh, uh, an example model of a society. So what do we have here? We have 40 uh, individuals, and they sort of abstract citizens, or maybe people at the reception. Uh, if, suppose corona was gone, this could be us, and uh, only I, I have a few le fewer people than we really are, and we could be gathering for the reception for instance. And the black and white, it could be gender, or it could be wearing glasses or not, or speaking Dutch or not. Uh, I did not specify that here. This is the, the nice thing about a model. You can simplify things. But the point of this run that I'm show, going to show here is all these agents are identical, except that uh, some of them are black and white, and they have misunderstandings based on color. So those that are black, if they try to be nice to somebody who is black, the black, uh, other black person will understand. If they try to be nice to, be some, to somebody who is white, they may misunderstand and actually get angry because these are grasp agents. So they will form groups. Now they don't know one another yet. They're new to one another. Now we'll run it. They will form groups. And if a group stays together, it develops one of aura in color. It develops a color aura. But many of them don't stay together. But you see something happen, right? There's a self-organization by color. They go, when they, when they leave a group because they're angry, they go to a random other group. But it just happens that they end up very often in groups of their own color. And it's also the case that when they have a fight, the loser loses a little bit of status and becomes smaller. The avatar becomes smaller. And the winner's avatar becomes bigger. And you can see that we have now got a stratified society, entirely by chance. So the, the beginning of the simulation uh, determines who gets the status and who doesn't. And this is nice because with minimal uh, suggestions and minimal uh, things, they, they have no memory, they have no relations, I still get uh, uh, believable patterns of society. In this case, it's an individualistic society. They find it easy to leave groups and they have misunderstandings. So you get fights all the time. So this allows me to try all kinds of societal configurations. You can find this model on the web, by the way. Uh, there's a ComSys computational library that has models, and you can just uh, download them and play them in NetLogo. Now I have exactly the same agents. You have the, 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 the site, but they are colorblind. They don't care about black or white. Uh, they can uh, perfectly well uh, agree. So it means they are more likely happy and they don't run away from their group so often. So this could be the same society, but in another phase, at a time when there's enough love to go around. And then actually it uh, leads to more stable group life. So I can vary with this to uh, simulate individualism and uh, xenophobia 
Individualism here, uh, so these are, this is another dimension that I didn't really talk about so far, means how uh, permissible is it, how status worthy to leave a group. Uh, maybe you're on, uh, on tennis, but it turns out you're not good at it, or there are some really no, uh, nasty people. You want to go to another thing, you go to uh, football or so. Uh, and uh, in the Netherlands, that would be allowable. Everybody would understand if you told them this. But there are many places where you are in some groups uh, because your parents are in those groups too, and you cannot really change. Uh, and those are collectivistic societies. Uh, or you are in a certain religion or a certain political party, and you just stay because that's what people do. Maybe it's in your passport. So on the right-hand side, you have s stable societies, collectivist. Uh, is uh, my time going to be up? Yep, yeah, okay. Uh, no worries, I'm almost done. On the left-hand side, it's individualistic. And you see that the xenophobia that we just saw only makes a big difference on the left-hand side. So on the right-hand side, could be uh, Afghanistan, there are different groups. Whether they get along well internally or not doesn't matter. They don't have much leeway to change or to leave. If you let those agents loose as migrants in an individualist, individualistic society, they might be very disoriented. So this kind of simulation allows me to visualize things that I know from the books and some of you know from experience. So uh, yeah, I want to pursue this line of thought. And uh, that means we have to uh, get uh, to round off now. So explaining why people do stupid things with these models is the aim of my work. Uh, I am not alone in this. Some of these people are in this uh, Krakow conference that is running today. This was actually in Wageningen before COVID, of course. Uh, so we do stupid things for love, maybe misguided love, but who am I to say so? We cannot help ourselves to love others. It's in our nature. Uh, we do as our reference groups taught us, or your children or your friends may do as you teach them. And you might be more of a reference group than you think, like I told you with the story with my friend in high school. Uh, that's actually quite likely. Uh, we can help those that come after us by being reference groups for them. Uh, if you want to read up on this stuff, maybe you could find the lecture somewhere later. And uh, that's the end of the story, and the questions are, I think, the next point. Thank you.